Hey there, piano teachers. Have you been looking for a motivating, exciting, interesting activity that you can do with your students that builds on some of their chord knowledge and some of their composing skills and uses nothing more than a free bit of technology that everyone with an iPhone and an iPad can access? Well, if that sounds pretty cool, then I'm really excited to introduce you to my course on GarageBand, which this is lesson one of. And in this video, I'm gonna be explaining a little bit about what you need to get started, why you might want to use this bit of technology, how it looks when you first open it, and I'm gonna show you a demo track or two that I've used with my students to give you a feeling for what it's capable of. Here we go. Welcome to lesson one of my GarageBand course for piano teachers. And in this little lesson, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of how GarageBand looks and feels, how it works, and also just talk about some of the um, issues around what you need and why you might wanna actually use this bit of kit. So my goal for this uh, course is to give you confidence that you could make really good use of this bit of software in your studio if you choose to. The great thing about GarageBand is that it's free. It comes automatically installed on every new iPad and iPhone. Uh, and if it's not already installed on your device, you should be able to install it uh, for free unless it's maybe too old a, a version or something like that. So I'm actually using an iPad Air 2. This is at least three or four years old, so it's not the latest technology. I know it works really well on the iPad Pros, which are the new bigger ones, but uh, older iPads like this one are totally fine. It works really, really well. So uh, all you need to get started is really the iPad app and some speakers. So it's important that you don't rely on the speakers that are inbuilt in this or in your phone because they're really not good enough quality to make an impact for students. If you really want that big bass and cinematic sound, and I know your students will want it, then you need to connect it up to a speaker system. So I've got here, uh, this is a really old Logitech system uh, that came out with desktop computers. This is at least 15 years old, I'd say. So it's got two speakers here and down the bottom, I'm not sure you can see that where this drink bottle's sitting on is a subwoofer. And a subwoofer just gives you incredible bass and it will make a big impact in the sound of the music coming out of your iPad. And this goes for any time you use an iPad. If you really want quality sound, please don't rely on the inbuilt speakers. They just they just won't cut it. So grabbing something like this, um, they're not very expensive. You can get something like this on Amazon. This is a Logitech system, Logitech 3.1 or 5.1. 5.1 is the number of speakers. These were designed as for surround sound movie listening. So three, Point 0.1 just means left, center, right speaker, that's the three. Point 0.1 means one subwoofer. So originally this had a center speaker with it as well. But have a look online. I also have uh, a website which I'll link to with this video, um, a web page I should say, which lists the resources I use in my studio uh, and helps you make some decisions there. So there's some links to Amazon and things like that. So we all need speakers. We need an iPad or some device with GarageBand loaded on it and a piano to play with as well. Now I'm using a digital here, but you don't need to use a digital. You can use an acoustic piano just as well. Although in one of the lessons, I will show you how you can take uh, sound straight from your digital piano and directly record it into GarageBand as well. But we don't have to do that. You can also do it via the microphone in your iPad. So um, there's no compulsion to connect this to a digital. Uh, I've used it many times in lessons with an acoustic piano as well. Okay, so why might you wanna use GarageBand? Well, GarageBand is brilliant uh, software for creating backing tracks, basically. So for, for creating things that students can play along to. And the fun thing about GarageBand is that students get to play, a bit, get to learn about the creation of their tracks. So I'm not suggesting you go away and you create something for students. This is something you do in lessons. So it, it's the kind of thing that requires a little bit more time than a 30 minute lesson. Uh, but it depends what you're doing with your student. If they're busily preparing for an exam or recital or something like that, then I doubt you're gonna have much time for this. But if you have a slightly longer lesson or you're teaching uh, teenagers who are interested in composing or pop music or chord progressions, then this is a brilliant tool for that. It's also great for summer camps, for group programs, uh, for uh, after they've just done their big recitals and you've got a couple of weeks of time when you can do some different things. I guarantee they'll love it. 
I tend to work with uh, students on my iPad in lessons, but if the student has their own iPad, they can bring that in and use it in lessons and then go home and keep working on things at home. You can also share files, which I'll show you in one of the final videos, between two iPads, so you can work in a lesson and then you can kind of bump it into their iPad before they go home. Uh, or you could just use this in lessons and they don't do anything at home as well. There's a huge amount of variety. It really depends on where you're going with it, their level of interest and things like that. So at least to start with, they don't need to have their own iPad. Um, although I'm finding that more and more parents actually do have an iPad that their child can use. Uh, when might you use this? Well, as I said before, it's gonna be dependent on how much time you have in a lesson and the goals for your students. I have a number of teenagers who I have a very flexible approach with. And we're working on composing and singing while they play, uh, lead sheet playing and those kinds of things. So this fits really, really well into that mix. And I can tell you that by using this and going through some of the ideas around my four chord composing, for example, uh, students will learn a heap about the theory of music as well. So it's a really practical way of putting theory into practice. Um, and so how does it all work? Well, we're gonna get into that uh, in just a moment. So what I thought I might do is actually just show you an example of a track that I created with one of my students. So I'm gonna click, uh, so this is, this is the main page and I'll, I'll explain more about it in just a moment, but I'm just gonna open up this one called George. So that was the name of my uh, student. I'm using AirPlay to connect this to my Mac. So that's why that warning came up. If you're using this in your studio, you shouldn't get that warning. So here we go, I'm just gonna play this track so you can get an idea for what GarageBand can do. So you can see we've got a, a progression of, of four chords that is moving through. You can hear there's bass, there's guitar, uh, there's some drums going on in the background, and each track is a different instrument in the mix. So you can hear now a hard rock guitar has been added in. That's the fourth green bar down. You can see the play bar moving across the screen as we go. And you're about to see an effect. See down the bottom here, these pink effects? Have a listen to what this has done. So do you hear that effect with the uh, frequency? So we cut all high frequencies out and then we brought them all back. That's a really simple trick that uh, dance music producers use and you can do it too. So here's a bit of a middle section of this acoustic arrangement. We've got a different rhythms, uh, different rhythm section, sorry, and we've got a different guitar pattern. Now my student's a pianist. He didn't record any guitar into this. This is what Carriage Band can actually do. And there's another bit of effects coming up, so I'll just jump up further here. So that kind of jerky, uh, 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 that was all another effect, which I'm gonna show you in one of our later videos. So that's just a quick example of the kinds of things it can do. Basically, my student George, he took a chord progression that we did with four chord composing, and then he created a whole mix out of it. And what he would do would, would be, he'd play along to it, or he'd, he would improvise over the top while this was playing. So there's lots of flexible things you can do with this bit of, uh, bit of kit, which is why I love it so much. Um, I even did, um, there's, there's a, a famous song called uh, You're the Voice by John Farnham, an Australian artist over here. I had to perform it with a choir at one stage and the mix, the original mix includes a whole lot of clapping and we needed that and we didn't have people to clap it, so again,
and that was playing while we performed this this work. So, it, it, you know, it's not just uh, something that you can do for composing, although it's great for that. There are a whole lot of other ways that you can use this. Even if you wanted to use it for quickly getting a drum beat for a student in a lesson, that could work as well. So uh, let's give you a really quick overview of the main screen. And then in the, in the next lesson, we're going to actually start creating a new track from scratch. So in the top left corner, you've got a plus button. And if I click that, you've got the option to create a new song. And it says here, iCloud Drive. That's just another way to create music. But I tend to create new songs uh, using um, GarageBand itself and recording onto my local device. So I just clicked on uh, GarageBand, creating a new song here. And you can see these are all our instruments that we can choose. And we're going to be doing that in the next lesson. So I'm just going to go back to that main page. If you hold a track or a piece, uh, a song, one of these songs down, you'll see things start to wobble. And that's a familiar uh, user interface um, uh, for uh, iPhone and iPad users because it now means that you can move things around or do things to them. So you can now see that in the top left, we've got our share buttons, we've got a duplicate button and a trash button and a cloud. So that's just a way of manipulating those files now that you've selected them. Uh, so you could, if you wanted to delete one, that's how you do it. If you wanted to duplicate it, that's how you do that as well. I'm going to click in the top right done to go back to the main page. You can see these are sorted by date. You can also click the name button in the middle to sort them by name. Totally up to you. And what you'll find is that you've if you've never used GarageBand before, then this will be totally blank. Uh, and you'll be ready for you to build your first new track. Uh, so with that, I'm going to leave this first introduction video and we're going to um, head over to module two, which is when we're going to start recording our first uh, track and creating a new track from scratch. So that's coming up in video number two. And then just for a sneak peek in the rest of this series, uh, we're going to be including uh, videos on how to uh, put enter chord progressions in there, how to uh, use the editing effects, uh, quantizing, which puts everything on the beat. So even a student that's a little bit out of time can be uh, adjusted in time. Uh, we're gonna talk about live loops, the difference between the session drummer and the other drum options. There's heaps coming up and I'm really, really excited that you're gonna be joining me on this and uh, looking forward to seeing you in video number two when we start actually putting all of this into practice. Until then, have fun.